you to close your eyes or lower your gaze, whatever feels comfortable for you. If your eyes are open, just taking a, a soft downward look past the tip of your nose without clear focus. Taking a posture that feels dignified and upright and relaxed at the same time. Finding a place of stillness for the body. I find it helpful just to begin with a few deeper than normal breaths, especially extending the exhalation, which relaxes the nervous system. And whenever you're ready, letting the breath return to its normal rate and rhythm. And allowing your attention simply to come to sensation in the body. What do you notice? Maybe it's the sense of the weight of the body on the seat. Maybe the sensation you're most aware of is sound. Sensing the air moving across your skin. Whatever it is that you notice, staying with that sensation until it's no longer interesting and another sensation arises to take its place. This is the practice of exploring and lingering. And then gently moving on.
Noticing where your attention is now. And if it's wandered off, you can welcome it back. Invite the body to relax again. And when you're ready, come back to sensation in the body.
As we close our meditation together, I'd like to offer a brief loving kindness practice. So if you'd like to place one or both hands on your heart center and silently repeat these phrases. May I be well. May I be peaceful. May I be safe and protected from harm. May I enjoy happiness and freedom from suffering. May I live with ease. May all beings be well. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be safe and protected from harm. May all beings enjoy happiness and freedom from suffering. May all beings live with ease. Thank you for your practice. Um, glad to have you back here. And um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right. So just to give you a sense of where we are in the world, um, we are in Ladakh. Whoops. Did I just lose you? No, I didn't. How swell is that? Um, okay. Ladakh is in the northeastern bit of... India. It is a union territory of India, about 400 miles northeast of where the Dalai Lama lives in Dharamsala. That 400 miles takes 16 hours to drop. Um, I just find that fascinating, especially after being there on those roads. I know why it takes 16 hours. It's in the Himalayas. Um, it's bordered by Tibet, Pakistan, and China. So since it's on the border of China, there is something of a military presence there, which was never too terribly intrusive, but and also quite impressive. It is no, it's known as Little Tibet because it is um, really the last stronghold of Tibetan Buddhism since China has has invaded what was Tibet. So um, Tibetan Buddhism was always or it always is a long, long time. And it was a long, long time that Tibetan Buddhism has been present in that area. And now it's um, it's a cherished place because it is such a small area. In, in, um, in Tibet, there were thousands of monasteries. There are now nine. And I believe there are 900 in Ladakh. So let's look at some pictures. Yes. What is the doctor here on this map? Is it it's, the red piece? It's the red piece. Red piece, yeah. So that gives you another sense of where it is. And that's what it looks like. I'm still blown away by being able to look at it. It's the Indus River, which is that glorious color of green because of minerals that come down from the Himalayas and turn it that color. These are some stupas. We see these stupas everywhere on all the roadsides. Um, and a stupa is a, a sacred site that often has the remains of a, a Buddhist nun or monk. It's a sacred site that almost always has a path around it as well. So the, so you circumambulate around it, keeping it on your right. 
it's always walking around it in this direction. How tall is the stupa? They are various sizes. Um, I don't know that I saw any that were smaller than maybe 10 or 12 feet tall and so many that are much, much larger. It's also a very cheerful place. Bro is the borough of road organization, but I do love that the sign says bro. <laughs> Don't, and these signs are, are alongside all, all the roadways. Um, so I just wanted to show you a little bit of Tibetan humor. This is the downtown city of Leh, which is one of the capitals. There are two capitals of Ladakh and Leh is one of them. I just loved that there are prayer flags everywhere. Um, I'm just, but I, I'm just going to repeat questions because the people on Zoom can't hear your questions unless you have the mic and running back and forth at this moment would not be useful. Um, so is it just this time of year? No, the prayer flags are there all the time. Oh, when I visited, I went in the end of May, the last two weeks in May. This is one of the monasteries with prayer wheels. Many of the monasteries have prayer wheels lining all of the outer walls. And so people go by and spin those also in a clockwise direction, repeating the chant, Om Mani Padme Om. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. Another one of the monasteries. These are very, very old, old places. This is showing one of the older ones. Pardon me, where... Um, these are the living spaces of the monks. This one is Tikse, where we spent most of our time. We stayed in a hotel at the bottom of that hill, so near those stupas that you see. And uh, the ceremonies were at the very top of the hill. So we spent a lot of time walking up a lot of steps, about 200 steps. My watch was very impressed with the number of Stairs I, stairs I climbed in those two weeks. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the decorations of these places. The temples are decorated beautifully. The doors are especially, I don't know, just lovely to me. This is the courtyard of, of the Tikse Monastery. And here is a... Um, part of a puja ceremony. I'm hoping you can hear. Can you hear? Yeah. Sound, sound, also worked. sound also worked earlier, sorry. Oh, I have to change mine. Okay. Um, I really wanted you to be able to hear these. This is a uh, big, these are the big horns. They're standing on the top of the monastery and you can see the village down below. Um, they are very loud. And because we were there at a very aus auspicious time, we were there for the head Lama, the head monk's birthday, the Rinpoche, and for the celebration of Buddha's birth, death, and enlightenment. So the big horns come out and um, call the people to the puja, the prayer service. And here's the procession of the Rinpoche coming in for his birthday. The last fellow here is the Rinpoche. And he then gets to sit in the big throne with a great big bowl of rice with cashews and um, apricots. A mandala in the, in the uh, temple. That also is a special thing that we got to see. It doesn't happen always. And the last day that we were there, they then destroyed the mandala and um, the monks eat a little bit of the sand and then they um, put it into the into a pond at the bottom of the hill. Just a, a beautiful demonstration of impermanence. 
that's made of sand. Yeah. This is the Tara temple. Tara is said to have been born with Avalokiteshvara, who also has the name um, um, Genrazik and Kuan Yin. And he was, they, he, she was born of the tears of compassion from Amitabha, who was the, the Buddha at that time. And um, she and Chen Rizik were born of Amitabha. These names are <clears throat> challenging for me. She is the female goddess of compassion, had studied with the Buddha of her time and her place and was a very advanced student, um, was blessed by the Buddha, takes the vow of the Bodhisattva. And the men say, oh, maybe you can pray next time to come back in the form of a man. And she says, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm fine just how I am. And y'all have lots of male teachers and I'm gonna come back for the women. Um, so that's what, what she is. And this is my, the, uh, a 40 foot sculpture of, the, of Maitreya, who's the future Buddha. Here's Chen Rizik in his temple, and he has a thousand arms and often four or five heads so that he can help as, men, as many people and heal the sufferings of the world. So he and she are both the healers of suffering, the great compassion. This is the temple. We spend a lot of time in this temple, which is very large and um, I don't think that scarf is holding up that pillar, but I don't know. Here is a story of the four friends, the four harmonious friends. I love this. Um, it's a story of this bird who could not fly, was first to come upon this, this tree as it when it was a very small sapling. And the bird could eat a little bit from the ground and from the little bits that fell from the tree. And then the, the tree got too tall and the rabbit came and the rabbit could eat some things and the bird could sit on the rabbit's head and the rabbit, then the bird could eat some things. And then the tree grew even taller and the monkey came and the monkey could, could reach and could climb some, but couldn't get to the very top. And then the elephant came. And the story is really a story of interdependence, how we all need to learn to ask for and receive help. This is just a picture of a bridge. I don't know if you can see clearly that these are prayer flags strung all along, all across the bridge. Many, 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 many. Another prayer wheel. This was at the nunnery. Stupas there. That gives you a better sense of uh, the size of the stupas in comparison to our bus. Is it very dusty? Huh? Yes, it's very dusty and it's very dry. It's a high desert. So the humidity is basically 0.01%, which meant we all looked like dried apricots within a day or two. Um, and this is at 10,000 feet or 11,000, close to 11,000 feet. So it's very high and it's very bright and the sun is very strong and it's just beautiful. And there are the Himalayas right there. I'm still stunned by that. This is one of the nuns at the nunnery. The nuns live a much more simple life than the monks do. They don't have quite the resources that the monks do. And here's the wheel of life. Um, the wheel of life is another mandala and it's a complex view of the, the Buddhist view of, of life, the cycle of life, death, rebirth, and suffering. Um, that as Buddhists, we try to escape altogether. And this is, um, this is how it looks. This is how our lives look. This fellow here is the, is called Yama and he is the Lord of death or the monster of impermanence. He's not really as terrible as he looks. He's actually a fierce or they call wrathful protector of the Dharma and of Buddha 
and of Buddhists. So he's here holding this wheel of life. Um, and you see in the upper right-hand corner is the Buddha who's pointing toward the other side where you see a moon and um, nirvana, enlightenment, the place you go when you've gotten through all the rest. Um, so I'm going to go through this rather quickly um, and won't be able to say a lot about all of it. This in the center, but I'm sorry, this, the outer edge represents the 12 stages of dependent origination. I wish I could talk about all those. Can't do it. Um, this in the center is uh, the three fires or the three poisons. They represent greed, anger, and ignorance. In every one of these wheels, wheels of life, you'll see a bird, a snake, and a pig representing greed, anger, and ignorance. Um, and these are the forces that keep the wheel of life turning, that keep us in this samsara of coming around and around and around. These are the causes of suffering. The outer circle shows the um, outer circle, the, the circle around those three poisons shows demons taking beings to the hell realms, to the underworld, and shows bodhisattvas leading people back up into the, the upper realms. So these six realms are the places where we spend our time. Um, there are certainly people who believe that these are actual places that we go, and then we can move around from one place to another. More often, it's thought of as an allegory, and you may find as we go through these stages, these realms, that, well, let me just speak for myself. I visit them daily. So, you know, and you may know people who do. <laughs> so the realm of humans that's here on the right side, this is the most fortunate state to be born into. We are not suffering as heavily as those in the other realms, but there isn't so much bliss that we uh, lose track of everything. We have a chance to learn the Dharma. We have a chance for enlightenment. We have a chance to move out of the wheel of samsara, out of this whole wheel of life entirely. But this is the only place where we have that chance. The realm of the gods, which is in the center there, it, also called the Deva, Deva realm, um, they live in a sense of bliss. They are populated, the Deva realm is populated by godlike beings who enjoy great power, wealth, and long life. They live in splendor and happiness. So why learn? Why notice anyone else who's suffering? Why have compassion? So eventually the gods die and they go somewhere else because they can't become enlightened. Though you will see in each of these um, realms, there is a bodhisattva in each realm that is there to offer assistance to move to a better place. And then we have um, the realm of the angry gods, which is to the left there. And those are beings who wind up there because they, because of the, their karma of, of hate and jealousy. They can never get enough. They never get what they deserve. They are always grasping. They are hyper competitive and paranoid. Anybody know anybody like that? Um, they have power and resources and often accomplish a great deal. But they're always, their first priority is themselves and getting to the top. As you can see there, they have this beautiful tree, the base of the beautiful tree. And the fruit of the beautiful tree is in the God realms. And so they are quite angry and they work very hard to, to uh, topple the gods. But the gods, you can see in the tree with the fruit, have their own army. And so that's what the gods are busy doing. So now we move to the lower realms, which are not nearly as pleasant, I'm sorry to say, and hopeful that each one of these realms does have its own bodhisattva to help us help us through it. 
the first one is the one to the left. Is that right? Nope, that's no, it's the other. It's, I'm sorry, it's to the right. I'm looking at this backwards. Um, the one to the right is the realm of the hungry ghosts. These are people who um, are trapped in this realm because of overattachment to the world, to the things of the world, the pleasures of the world. And so they, in this realm, they can never be satisfied. Their app appetites are insatiable. Anything they eat can't travel down their their mouths, they're, they're pictured as having huge distended bellies, long skinny necks and teeny tiny mouths. They can't take anything in, there's no satisfaction. They're desperate for enjoyment, for nourishment, for anything that they, as you can see these people near the water, they're looking for water and what comes to them is flames. It's a very, very unhappy place to be. So these ghosts are characterized by insatiable hunger and craving. They're also associated with addiction, compulsion, and obsession in our language. Greed and jealousy lead to rebirth as a hungry ghost. People who have everything but always want more might be hungry ghosts. And then the realm of the animals, which is on the other side. Animals are used by humans, and humans believe we, might, we must treat them with compassion. But they don't lack, they lack the necessary awareness to become enlightened. And they are really pretty simple and um, frightened in new situations. They like to um, just stay in one place and be very complacent there. And, excuse me, their existence is characterized by ignorance and fear, knowing that they might be prey and needing to be sure that they get fed. Um, so, they cling to what's familiar. Oh, it also says they have no sense of humor. That's been my experience with pets, at least. They're not funny. I, I find them funny, but I don't think they're laughing. Um, and then we have the, the hell realm. At the bottom of the wheel here is the hell realm. This is a really interesting spot. People are horribly tortured in really horrible ways. Um, I thought about trying to actually did try to enlarge this so you could really see things. And I'm glad it didn't really work very well because it is miserable. Um, so people here are tortured, but not forever. They are tortured and they stay in this hell realm until their bad karma is burned off or worked off. Everything makes these beings angry. Um, unchecked anger and aggression can cause rebirth in the hell realms. So if you look here in the center, there's lots of torturing happening. There are people in a cauldron being burned. Um, there are also dreadful other things happening that we'll just leave to your imagination. They are dreadful. On the, on the hmm, right side, we see people in ice. And this is the anger that's characterized by that icy, cold, mm-mm, mm-mm. And we can get stuck there, right? On the other side are the people who are being burned in a sea of flame. So those are the people that have aggressive anger, fury. And I don't know, I've visited that spot once or twice. Um, so the cool thing is, I keep reminding myself and you, there's a bodhisattva there as well. We do get to move from one to the other. And these are the thing, the passages we go through as we study, as we learn, these are the, these are the things we are working as we study the Dharma to be free of. So this is just a, I, I think, just a beautiful representation. And these are outside the walls of just about every monastery and every temple. There is a wheel of life. They are different in each case and very much the same in each case. And there are cows. <laughs> I was not very afraid of this cow, but 
I was a little bit afraid of this cow. But a sweet story about the cow. I have three more minutes. This is a short, short story. I didn't see this happening, but the people who were walking back to our hotel behind me heard, I heard the singing. And then the other people heard, saw a woman milking her cow, singing to her cow as she milked the cow. The cows wander in the streets all day. And then when it's time for dinner, they go back to their homes and they moo at the doors, at the gates, and they are let in. And apparently some of the people sing to them as they milk them before their suppers. I'm sorry, we don't have really much time for questions, but if anybody has something they would like to ask or say, please, um, I'm gonna stop this sharing and make it so that we can see you on the screen. Questions, comments? I'm gonna ask you to use the mic so that folks on Zoom can hear you. Um, are there sanghas in, in the different neighborhoods you visited? Interesting, meditation is not really practiced. The practice is much more often that there are um, people wear and carry prayer beads, these malas, and they do this all the time, walking down the street. They they chant Om, om Mani Padme Om. So the meditation practice isn't, isn't very common, but compassion is built into the culture. It's how people live. They sing to their cows. They, they their sing cows. to their cows. Yes, thank you, Dinah. Dinah, Dina. Dina, thank you. Mary Louise. Can you say a little something about the young people? They look like young boys. Oh, there are present? boys. The baby dukes. The baby dukes. Baby monks. Um, yes, the baby monks are adorable. Uh, the youngest one was seven. He is the nephew of the Rinpoche, the head monk. And um, we had a teacher. One of the monks was assigned to us as a teacher. And he joined the monastery at the age of 12. He wanted to join. He wanted to join. He wanted to join. His parents finally let him join. He's now an adult. Um, I don't know that all of the baby monks feel that way. That seven-year-old never really looked like he was having a great time. Um, except for when they were like beating the drums. They have a great time beating the drums and playing a little conch shells. Um, I don't know. It was a little heartbreaking to see some of the baby monks. And they were also well cared for by the adults. I don't know. Anything else? The outermost ring of the wheel is the... Um, that is... Find my screen again. We are at the end of our time and I will continue to answer questions happily. But if any of you want to go, need to go, please know that you are welcome to do so. And thank you for being here. <laughs>